Ah, yeah, I see it. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's a pleasure to have Brian Swingle. He's here to tell us about conformal field theories and how they are magical. Yeah. Take it away. All right. Um, thanks very much for having me. Hope you all are staying safe and sane during this time period. Um, yeah, so I want to tell you about how conformal field theories are magical. I guess they're magical in many ways. Many of us love conformal field theories, but I will speak about a precise technical sense in which they are magical. Um, this is some work that I've been doing with Christopher and Charles, which I think will appear soonish. I maybe within a couple of weeks. Um, and they thank the Department of Energy and and um, the NSF for supporting this. And yeah, so it's really about trying to characterize the entanglement structure and the complexity of of a lattice regulated field theory in a way which goes beyond just counting gates. So sort of saying something more about what kinds of gates are present and you know how those gates are distributed in the circuit that you can use to prepare the say the ground state of this theory. Okay. Um, here's the outline. So I'm going to start out with some broad comments on complexity just to kind of um, let you know where I was coming from when this project started. And then I'll define magic and mana for you because there's probably things you're not familiar with. Um, at least those of you in the high energy community. Um, and then I'll just tell you the main result, which is that we compute the mana, which is a measure of magic um, for a model, a 1D spin model called the POTS model. And uh, that's what this little graph here shows. The little x-axis there is the model parameter, which can vary between two different phases. One is a ferromagnetic phase where the spins align, and one is a paramagnetic phase where they kind of don't align at all, or they align in a different orthogonal direction. And our result is that the mana is largest, and hence the magic is largest at the critical point. That critical point in the long distance limit corresponds to a three-state POTS CFT. And uh, hence, we conclude that the CFT is magical in this sense of sort of being the most magical point in the entire phase diagram. So I'll try to explain a little bit what that means in this talk and why I'm interested in it. Although I'll be honest with you and say this is sort of early days for this direction. I think it sort of smells interesting, but uh, there's not so much that we understand yet. I mean, we understand this model now, I think, but there's a lot more to do. Um, and then at the end, I'll discuss some directions and some more vague speculative thoughts per the organizer's uh, request. Okay. So, and please, uh, please stop me anytime with questions. So my thought process for getting into this began with the wormhole story that uh, by now many of you are familiar with. So here the idea is we have a, a holographic quantum field theory. In fact, we have two of them corresponding to the two black lines here on the left and right of this box picture. And they're in an entangled state, which corresponds to the geometry in between these two black lines. And uh, we can probe this geometry by asking, for example, about the distance or the volume that connects these two sides at different times. Time runs up in the diagram and sort of space, the radial direction runs horizontally. And at time zero, we find that there's a sort of connection or a wormhole which, which couples them. You can't traverse through this wormhole from one side to the other, but you can have spatial connection and correlation. And at initial time, this wormhole has some fixed initial value of its size. And then as time increases, we find that the wormhole grows linearly with time. And at first, this was interpreted, or I mean, so one consequence of this is something to do with entanglement dynamics. In, the field theories. But later, uh, particularly Lenny's work argued that this had something to do with complexity. And in, in particular, it meant the complexity of the quantum state was increasing linearly with time. And here complexity was taken to mean roughly just like the number of gates you need to apply to uh, produce the desired state from some given initial state. And um, for me, you know, What's interesting here is 
not that complexity grows linearly with time. I mean, that's sort of something that at least I absolutely expected to happen. I think it's a, it's a natural, natural guess or supposition in the context of quantum simulation, for example. I mean, this is like the benchmark scaling that people who do Hamiltonian simulation try to achieve. They want to have a simulation call switch scales as the space time volume of the system you want to simulate. So that's maybe not so surprising, but what's surprising to me at least was that this complexity was manifested in a simple geometrical feature of the bulk. So it's the sort of mapping, which is the interesting part to me. And you can say, well, you know, what in the world is, does this space-time geometry have to do with, uh, with complexity? You know, why would you think this? But I, I think it's actually not so crazy. Um, if I may toot my own horn a little bit, I think, um, from the point of view of thinking about, say, the ground state of the CFT in terms of a uh, tensor network, which encodes the wave function in some, in this case, hierarchy of renormalization group scales, there was this story that I and others told, which said that you could really sort of see an emergent extra dimension or some kind of new space, which was the tensor network, from the entanglement structure. And I don't want to argue that, uh, you know, that this and that particular tensor network corresponds to real space versus kinematic space, et cetera. That's all very important and very interesting. I just wanna say, I think this is like a consciousness raising moment where we can say, okay, we have a, a, a pretty clear picture here where we can associate space time with some kind of network or circuit or something. And from that point of view, then the complexity story, I think is sort of more reasonable. It's less out of the blue. And indeed, I think this was the way that that Lenny and others came to this, or at least one of the pieces of evidence that, that led them to this point. And you know, you can actually ultimately make a fairly precise kind of picture, tensor network picture, going back to Hartman and Maldacena and something that we elaborated on in our complexity equals action paper, where you can think of this growing wormhole as composed of three pieces. Um, the left and the right outermost pieces are like the the RG part of the network, which maps you from the microscopic UV Hilbert space to some effective low energy coarse grained Hilbert space. And then you have a growing uh, sort of wormhole part, which corresponds to the growing time evolution. And we even had a sort of simple argument that if you apply the UV time evolution to the outside of this network, you can kind of pass it through the RG network or renormalize it and produce an effective dynamics at the infrared scale, which just corresponds to growing the wormhole. Okay, so I think that's a pretty nice qualitative story. And one of the things that's interesting is that story does not seem very specific to gravity. And I think that's something that um, is true for many of these complexity stories. So for example, in Isaac's talk, I regard it um, as a reasonable hypothesis to say that, that more or less any chaotic quantum many-body system would produce pseudo-random states of the type that Isaac needed. And so from this point of view, if you had some system that's evaporating, which just means emitting radiation into the vacuum surrounding it, um, you know, that all the statements that Isaac made would presumably be true even for that case. Maybe the time scales would depend on the precise structure of the interactions and so forth, but the pseudo-randomness itself seems like a plausible thing to guess generally. Hey, Brian, let me uh, pause you real quick. Um, we have a question from Luca Tagliacozzo. Uh, he asked, have you checked this story numerically? Um, and he was not able to perform the coarse grain Hamiltonian or the coarse graining that needs, that he needs to have it change with time. Yeah, good question. I actually did not. Um, we, we have a kind of project that's sort of working towards this, but it, nothing's really happened yet. So um, I'd be curious to hear from you maybe in the discussion, you know, what you tried and why it didn't work. But yeah, we did not try it numerically. There's a sort of very toy model where you take um, like toric code or something like that for which we have an exact Mara and you randomize the coefficients of the different stabilizer terms and then you can kind of sort of get some complexity growth that you can actually compute analytically for a short period of time, but it won't continue forever because it's still stabilizer. Um, but yeah, I think it's interesting to understand this better. Yeah, so um, good. 
so then going back to what I was saying, I think you have a pretty, pretty generic picture actually, which plausibly could apply to a, a wide variety of chaotic systems, chaotic quantum systems. And I think that's not a bad thing. It, it, it you know, it's sort of unity of physics and all that. Um, but it does suggest that we need to look a little bit closer to understand, say, what's special about um, holographic models with a sparse spectrum of operators versus your favorite Ising model. And um, so to that end, let me go back now to the ground state. And that's what this talk is going to be about. Hold on. Yeah, let me go back to the ground state. The rest of the talk is going to be about the ground state. And for the ground state, we have this sort of mirror-like picture, um, which I flashed before. And, and you know, maybe just to be concrete, let me say that there's a lot of work by many people establishing that this sort of network in 1D and higher dimensions can capture a wide variety of phases of matter. Isaac and I summarized a lot of this um, literature in our paper about deep mirror. And I think that the basic thing I would argue is that there's sort of a huge class of states of matter, everything that don't have Fermi surfaces for which this is plausibly enough to represent the ground state. So the architecture is there, but it doesn't seem to distinguish different possible phases uh, very well. All, all, they all seem to have roughly the same architecture. So here again, we see the need to kind of look inside the blue boxes, look inside the tensors to figure out what's going on that distinguishes different situations from each other. And so that's the question that motivated the study that I'm gonna tell you about today. And I don't claim to have the answer. I'm not sure this is the right direction even, but it's sort of interesting, something I had not thought about before. It amused me. And um, we found some amusing things. So I'm gonna share that with you now. Okay, so let's talk about motivations for magic. I'm gonna define it precisely in a moment, but here I'll um, be a little bit schematic. So one thing is if you talk to experimentalists, um, maybe many of you don't do that, but if you do talk to experimentalists, you'll learn that, that not all gates are created equal. Some of them are easier to implement than others, depending on the situation. Um, and this is not just a sort of practical, dirty experimental fact. You know, there are things like easton Canal theorem, which tells you that you know, fault tolerance schemes are constrained in certain ways. Like you can't implement all your gates in a, in a quote unquote nice way. So you have to think uh, more generally. And in, in many cases, the set of easy gates include what are called Clifford gates. And uh, again, I'll define these formally in a moment, but this set of Clifford gates is, for those of you who are field theorists, it's sort of roughly like Gaussian operations. So it's like free particle dynamics, essentially. And the states that uh, you can make from Clifford operations are called stabilizers. And those are roughly like Gaussian states of free particles, but very, very roughly. Okay. Um, and in this context, there is a concept of something called a magic state, which is something that Bravi and Kataev uh, talked about um, in some pioneering work, which you can use as a resource to go beyond stabilizer states. So the point here is you want to do full set of gates, but Clifford gates are not enough to reach every possible state of interest. They're not universal, and so you need something extra. And this thing called a magic state is something you can inject as a sort of resource into your computation to go beyond the space of stabilizer states. Okay, so you know if you're interested in simulating quantum field theories or simulating lattice models, it's interesting to actually to ask about how much magic it's required to do that simulation. Okay, so that's one motivation. Now, another motivation comes from ADS-CFT, where we're very familiar with all these different conjectures of varying degrees of rigor about the entanglement structure. So S stands for entropy, EP is entanglement purification, SR is reflected entropy, negativity is neg, et cetera. There's a whole list of wonderful things people have talked about. And these are all measures you can compute in holography or at least conjecture formulas for. And, um, you know, you want to kind of encapsulate what you learn from these computations in some kind of effective model of the entanglement. And in this context, actually, again, stabilizer states have been a common reference in the literature for uh, this kind of thing. 
I don't mean to imply that the state's literally a stabilizer state, but it may be nevertheless in some sense a useful effective model of the entanglement structure. Uh, for example, there was this, I forget what it's called, bipartite dominance. Yeah, this proposal in this paper, um, which gives a precise conjecture, well, semi-precise conjecture for what the entanglement structure looks like. And that's something that we might try to um, check in principle by st studying some measure which is sensitive to this claim decomposition. And because the state decomposition, well, if you're interested in stabilizers, then again, magic gives you a way of asking how stabilizer-like the state is. Okay, so these are two, um, I think, good, if vague, reasons to think about magic in many body systems, which, by the way, there are a few papers, but I think not much has been said about it so far. But, but for me, really, it's just when I first sort of started, heard about this from Charles and started thinking about it, it just sort of seemed interesting. So that's why we've been doing this, this work. And I hope to tell you a little bit about what we found and, and why I think it's interesting in their opinion. Okay. So, stabilizers, Cliffords, and et cetera. So the starting point is we're gonna have a system of a bunch of Q state degrees of freedom arranged in say a one dimensional chain. You can arrange them however you like, but that's what we'll consider. And the, the parameter Q is the local Hilbert space dimension that also enters via this Q root of unity, omega, in all the formulas. And so the idea is you have generalization of poly operators, X and Z, which generalize to this clock-like operator Z and the shift-like operator X, although it doesn't actually matter which one you regard as which. They have the same spectrum. So the, the clock operator Z tells you, you know, where around the unit circle you're sitting as a root of unity. And the X operator shifts you around that circle. And then uh, we have these T operators here, T, A, A prime, which are all of the combinations of these elementary poly operators that we can construct in which form a complete basis. And then with this setup, uh, the Cliffords are just this, those unitaries which map strings of these poly operators to themselves up to a phase. Okay. So the most general possible unitary would map a single poly to a superposition of different polys, but Cliffords are special in that they map polys to themselves again up to a phase. And you know, it just turns out when you when you look at the structure of this group, it's finite and it doesn't therefore span or even approximate all the states of interest, uh, all the unitaries of interest. And it can be generated by a nice simple set of sort of one body gates and like a sum operation. So this this K and H are acting on single Q, Q state systems and then the S is like a controlled sum, generalizes the controlled knot. And then from this point of view, uh, you can add one more gate to the mix to make it universal. In many contexts, people choose that gate to be a so-called T gate. This T should be distinguished from the, the polys up here. So don't get confused, it has no, no subscripts. And it's basically doing a rotation on one qubit by some sort of fractional power of omega, basically. Okay, so once you have this T gate, then you can do everything. And so if Clifford's are easy, but T gates are harder, then you might estimate the complexity or talk about the complexity in terms, not just of the total number of gates, but the number of T gates that you need to apply to get the state you're interested in. So then what's magic? Well, if we define a set of stabilizer states to be like this convex combination of all possible pure stabilizers, that is you flip a bunch of coins, and you prepare a stabilizer state, depending on the outcome of those coin flips with whatever probability you want based on those coin flips, um, then you get this set stab, stabilizer set. And um, again, the idea is magic states plus Clifford lets you do whatever you want. And so if you define a measure on a state, which is not increasing under Clifford operations, then you, you call it a magic monotone. That's a concept that was discussed in this uh, important paper by Veitch, Musabi, and Gottesman and Emerson, which so forms- Brian, 
Yes. Can you, can you repeat the definition of a stabilizer state again? Yeah, so you just take mixtures of pure states. So pure stabilizer state is just take all zero and apply Clifford. And then you can mix over those. So you can flip coins to decide what Clifford circuit to apply. Thanks. OK, um, and so perhaps the for this group, maybe a, a sort of a simple and fairly familiar idea would be something like the relative entropy of magic, which is given some state rho, you compute this relative entropy between the state rho and a state sigma, which is in the stabilizer set, and you minimize it over all such states. OK, so it's just sort of the minimum relative entropy between your state and a set of stabilizer states. So if your state is in the stabilizers, then this is zero. And if it's sort of some distance away, then it gives you a measure of how far apart they are. How computable is that quantity? Um, it's not computable, basically. Or at least it's hard. Um, we have some thoughts, and there is a literature, but we, we couldn't find a good way to do it in a nice way. So what we choose instead, actually, is something called the mana. Uh, I would say it's not quite as nice as the relative entropy, but it's much easier to calculate. Um, in this case, it's nicest for odd prime q. So we're going to take q equals 3 for most of this talk, which is the smallest odd prime. And in this case, we have something called discrete Hudson theorem. Uh, due to Gross, which says that if you have a pure state, there's a concept called a discrete Wigner function, which is non-negative if and only at the state of the stabilizer state. So what this means is, you know, if you're from, if you know something about Gaussian, um, like quantum optics or or free fermions, maybe I'm the only person here that loves free fermions. I don't know, but um, in this case, there is a well-known form of the Wigner function, which is just like trying to define a, like a quasi-probability distribution on phase space, where you try to sort of have a distribution for both x and p at the same time. And for Gaussian states, you can have an actual distribution for both x and p, which is positive. Um, but more generally, you have some negativity in that distribution. So it's not a true probability distribution. And that negativity is a sign of quantumness and of non-Gaussianity. So it turns out that there is an analogy of that for this case of odd prime local dimension. Um, you have what are called phase space point operators. The, the details don't matter too much, but basically what you do is you take your list of all poly strings, you sum over all of them. So that's one fixed thing. And then you conjugate that one fixed thing by these poly strings. And that gives you the label on this phase space point operator. So this is like an operator which roughly speaking is localized at some X and P um, for uh, for your Gaussian state. And, you know, maybe just to be explicit, you can think of this Z as like E to the I position and X as like E to the I momentum. And then the translation operator X will just shift the position, which is what you would normally expect. So this is like position and momentum, which are compactified on a torus. So then once you have this Wigner function, which just is obtained by taking your quantum state and expanding it in the complete basis of these phase space point operators, uh, then you can compute the negativity, the log negativity of this Wigner function, and that's the mana. That's it. You can also show, that's what was shown in this paper, one of the things shown in this paper is that this is also a magic monotone, so it's a nice measure of magic. Um, in fact, it gives an upper bound on the distillable magic. I won't need that fact here, but there is some precise statement, which is interesting. And this is, this is more computable. Um, essentially, if you have access to this Wigner function, you can just directly calculate this sum. It's, it still requires you to sum up a large number of numbers, which can be prohibitive and is so far prohibitive for us, although we're working on a better way to do it. Um, but we can compute this, say, for um, up to, uh, you know, say, a 7-qtrit or 8-qtrit subsystem in a large uh, mini-qtrit system. And so that's what I'll, that's what I'll tell you about. So now we need a model. We have a, we have a quantity to calculate. We need a model. Uh, and here, the, the point is uh, two is weird. So in, any sane person faced with a new quantity would 
calculated in the quantizing model. Um, but unfortunately, two is not an odd prime. So uh, we went to the next simplest thing, which is the Q equals three state POTS model. And that model is like a sort of relatively simple generalization of the Ising model, which there are two terms. One is an, a ZZ interaction, which wants the different spins to align in the Z basis. And one of them is an X field, a transverse field, which wants the spins to align in the X basis to all be plus one. And so in particular, um, when sine theta is close to zero and cosine theta is close to one, then the X term dominates. That's what we call a paramagnetic phase. Uh, the spins are just polarized in the X direction. It has a unique ground state. And the opposite limit where sine theta is large and cosine theta is small, um, then the ZZ term dominates. That's what we call a ferromagnetic phase. The spins prefer to align in the Z basis, and there are in fact three degenerate ground states or approximate degenerate ground states in that limit. That's a symmetry breaking phase. And we're just gonna consider a 1D chain and we're gonna calculate that quantity mana in the ground state. So here's what we do. We take that chain, we do matrix product state calculation to get the ground state as a matrix product state for a 128 site chain. So it's a big long chain. And for different values of theta. And then we look at subregions of size little l, that's this little l equals one, two, three, up to seven. We look at those subregions and we calculate the mana and then we divide it by the subregion size, which is the mana density here, as a function of theta. So the first thing we find is that the mana is extensive. So mana obeys a volume law. And the coefficient of that extensive term vanishes when either of these terms separately dominates. And because in that case, it's either all X or all Z, both of which are stabilizer states. So the magic has to vanish there and, and the mana has to vanish there. And then um, it increases essentially monotonically on both sides up to a maximum value at or very close to the quantum critical point which separates these two phases. Okay, so in other words, as a function of the angle theta which, prim which tunes you through the phase transition, the quantum critical point where the loner description is the three state POTS conformal field theory is the most magical point in the phase diagram and therefore, we say that conformal field theories are magical. I mean, to be precise, we're saying a lottice model is magical, but we sort of, uh, I will argue shortly that this is not, an inf not, not a UV structure, it's really a, something that exists at all scales. And so we think it in some sense really is a property of the, the CFT itself. Okay. And so that's one of our main results is this calculation of the mana um, density as a function of the parameter theta. One thing, additional thing I'll note is that depending on how we estimate it with different subsystems, as we increase the subsystem, the mana density keeps going up. So that means it's not just a strictly localized product state, which could still give you a lot of mana. There's actually some entanglement having to do with the, with the mana, with the way the mana is distributed. Okay, now uh, I'll show you one other uh, plot and then a picture which explains what we see. So let's just look at the top plot here. Now I'm taking two sites as a function of their separation delta x. So it's just two q trits. And I'm asking what is the mana of that two q trit system as a function of separation. And what you find is that uh, this black line is at the critical point. These lighter greeny yellow lines up here are in the ferromagnetic phase. The darker blue green lines below are in the paramagnetic phase. And what you find is that, um, well, in the ferromagnetic phase, there's some spontaneous polarization. And so the mana has a strong local component everywhere for all separations. In the ferromagnetic, I mean, in the paramagnetic phase, the mana decays very rapidly and at some distance just becomes exactly zero. And actually, even in the paramagnetic, even at the critical point, the mana decays in some way, some characteristic fashion, which we can fit to a power law but still exactly vanishes beyond some point. Okay, and uh, this is a bit mysterious to us at first, like why it would vanish. Like the, the naive guess originally would just be that it had, would go to zero as a power law because there's some correlation that's getting smaller and smaller like a power law. But it turns out that it's exactly zero, we think somewhere. 
And the reason why is, is kind of nice. So let, let me explain that by giving you a Mara picture of what's going on to bring it back to the original motivation. So here's a picture of Mara. Um, we're gonna use some notation where we, we have these little caps corresponding to tracing out legs. So this, this double cap notation corresponds to a folded picture. It just makes it easier to draw. And so from that point of view, the, the two site density matrix looks like this in Amera. We can trace out many of the, the, the tensors, but we have some kind of core correlation which comes from the, 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 the top tensor here, the red bar, and then many layers of Mara applied to it. And uh, we know from Mara that the way this works is sort of that each layer is like applying a quantum channel here called D, which um, has a fixed point, which is the decoupled state of the two sites, and which has a spectrum that corresponds to some contractions related to the scaling dimensions of the theory. So in other words, if I put in some arbitrary state up here at the top or whatever this top state is, and I kind of proceed, proceed along the different layers, after a while, I'm gonna get a representation of rho at separation delta x in terms of the, the limiting state, rho one times rho one, plus a correction, which is gonna be suppressed as a power. And what that means is if this state row one times row one happens to be a stabilizer state, which is indeed the case here, it turns out the local state is just maximally mixed in that stabilizer, then as long as there's a, a ball around row one times row one in that stabilizer set, that means that the distance between row delta x and the nearest state in the stabilizer set is actually given by this deviation, the log delta x part, minus a constant, which is basically how far the row one times row one is away from the frontier of the stabilizer state. So here's a picture on the right. We're applying this channel many times. At first, the state row is outside, and then we keep applying the channel, it gets closer and closer to the fixed point, and eventually it enters the stabilizer set, and after that point, the magic is, the mana is just zero. Okay. So actually, from this Mara point of view, we actually get a very simple, nice picture of why we expect to have a power law decaying um, mana, but with this kind of sharp cutoff where below a certain, beyond a certain distance is just zero. Okay, so that's a kind of interesting feature that you don't normally see in conventional correlation measures, and which is furthermore suggestive that, that sort of every layer here is still adding some, some magic to the story. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so, so that's kind of the picture. We have this calculation of magic numerically, which we can do with efficiently using matrix product states. There's still some questions there about how to do it in the best possible way and how to maybe calculate for big systems, but uh, seems to work. And uh, we have a nice picture of that magic in that state, which, uh, which, matches well with the, the Mara picture and lets us quantitatively understand why, say you have this funny law where you have power law decay and then a zeroing out of the Mara. We can actually also estimate the, the this original picture using a Mara plot. It's a little bit more speculative. We need to make more assumptions and I won't kind of talk about it here, but, but that's definitely something you can do. So now let me just give you one example of why this is sort of interesting to me and then I'll wrap up with some, some some speculations. So let, let's consider two cases, this 1D pot model we've been talking about and a 2D topological phase, Z2 topological phase. This is just like basically like Z2, discrete Z2 gauge theory in two plus one dimensions. In both cases, it's well known that you need a Mara to represent them. In the 2D case, there's an exact construction involving C knots for a simple a special model called the toric code. And in 1D, I mean, this is, well established numerically, and I just showed you, even in the case of this magic observable, it seems to um, give the right picture. And in the POTS case, I argue that there's magic at all scales. But in the Z2 case, that's actually not true. The reason why is there's one point in the phase where the ground state is actually a stabilizer state. This is the toric code point. And since any other point in the phase is adiabatically connected to that point by a short depth circuit, this follows just because there's a Hamiltonian path between the two of them, which is always gap. That means that although you need a Mara for any point in the phase diagram to capture the long range entanglement, 
the magic can actually be removed in the first few layers. So the magic is actually short ranged. So this is an interesting distinction between now two states that from an entanglement point of view, both require a Mara, but from a magic point of view have very different properties. So the POTS case has long range magic, if you like, and the Z2 case has only short range magic. So already we got something out of this. Maybe it's a more condensed matter style application, but we were able to distinguish these two situations just from the point of view of the complexity and the way it, the, the, the non clifford complexity and, and the structure of the circuit. Okay. okay, so let me talk about just a few comments and then I'll just leave with, with some speculative things. So uh, one thing which is interesting to look at is the Q dependence. This is something we did in mean field theory, which turns out to predict that the transition is, is becomes strongly first order for Q bigger than three and that the mana is really never close to maximal. This is because it's either always very strongly X or very strongly Z. Um, it's probably interesting to think about other kinds of large end type situations and see if you can get a more interesting critical behavior in a controlled sort of large end regime. In the vein of saying more about ADS-CFT, it's nice to think about continuum friendly measures, to think about, for example, sparse spectrum models, versus like symmetric orbifolds. Like you could just take what we did here and orbifold it and then you could have a, a magic for a, this orbifolded model. But it's interesting to ask if magic can distinguish these two things. We have some thought that maybe it can, but it's very preliminary. More broadly, I think if, if you find this direction interesting, we just need data. We don't, we have no almost nothing about uh, how magic behaves in the various situations. And we're starting to think about this, but I think there's really a lot to, to do and to calculate. And then back to the original motivation of simulation as well. Um, this, of course, has some bearing on simulation cost estimates in the quantum case, and, and also suggests some new, well, not new, maybe new to the many body community um, directions for classical simulation. Of course, it's known that if you're close to stabilizer, then it's easier to simulate, so, but maybe there's a question about how well you can do with some small amount of magic in capturing the physics of interest. And this could be nice because maybe you're not limited by entanglement anymore, but by magic. And maybe you can still get some physics you care about with a low magic onsets versus a low entanglement onsets. Okay, so that's kind of the, the magic story. Now I'll just take one or two more minutes to express some more general opinions per the organizer's request. Um, so one thing going all the way back to my first motivation, which was the complexity of geometry duality and growing wormholes, I sort of think it's fair to say that that's been unreasonably successful. I mean, it, just to be honest, it kind of seems cartoony to say that the complexity is literally equal to the action of something or the volume of something, and yet, it actually sort of passes a quite a few non-trivial checks. I mean, I'm not saying it can, I'm not saying we know it can be true exactly. I think there are actually a few cases in the literature now where we know there's a sharp issue, but it seems to work better than we would have ever thought. And I think part of that, again, to toot my own horn is, is this sensor network geometry picture, which, at least gives us a fairly crude understanding of why this kind of connection can make sense. But I think it works better than that, and I think we don't really understand why yet. Uh, the other thing I think is that we have a lot of toy models, tensor network models, et cetera, for thinking about complexity. But as I emphasized before, I think a lot of this is not distinguished between, say, a chaotic Ising model and a holographic field theory. And that's, again, both to me a triumph and a an opportunity. It's great that this single picture can encompass so many different physical systems. That's wonderful, wonderful unity in physics. But it does suggest that we can ask more refined questions and learn more about what distinguishes these different things from a complexity point of view. And then finally, I'll mention that I think there are some very basic issues that remain. So for example, the complexity of internal degrees of freedom. I actually think there's no known quantum algorithm which can simulate a large n non abelian gauge theory with a complexity per unit time proportional to n squared, which is what we would expect from say ADS-CFT or just the scaling of the entropy with n squared in the deconfined phase. I think we don't know how to do that actually as an algorithm. 
Um, there's technical reasons for why I think that, and may maybe someone can, maybe there's a simple fix. I don't know, I haven't thought carefully about it, but I think there is, um, there are some very basic issues that we still don't understand, especially having to do with the internal space. Okay, and, and with that, I'll, I'll stop and thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, so let's all unmute and uh, thank Brian. I have a quick question. Please. Oh. Yeah, um, uh, you, you might have already answered this in your talk, if so I apologize, but um, why are conformal field theories magical? I mean, do you have, is there a story that goes with that plot that the mana peaks at the critical point and do you expect it to generalize to other, um, some class of other CFTs? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, yeah, maybe I didn't, I probably didn't say this and I should have. Um, I think the basic reason is it's not surprising at all, um, which is that if either of these two terms dominates, the ZZ term or the X term, then it's clearly a stabilizer. And the critical point is exactly where they compete in a sort of maximal way. And so it's not at all surprising at that point that it's sort of maximally non-stabilizer-like. Um, and so in that sense, I think it does capture, it does, it's not surprising, it does capture a tension that you expect to generalize between, say, having states that are simple in one basis versus another basis. I see, so it's not um, really so much the fact that it's sort of conformal, I mean, the, there's no obvious, uh, like, like you could have a more complicated kind of parameter space where it might peak somewhere that's not at a critical point. Yeah, it's possible. So like, for example, if you do just mean field theory, um, then in, in mean field, it's the magic is just zero on the paramagnetic side, at least in one site, because it's just the whole X state. And so then it actually peaks a little bit to the left or a little bit inside the ferromagnetic phase. Um, yes, in general, this could this could be true, for sure. Um, this statement I made about sort of maximum competition is vague and possibly not true in general. There may be other points where it's at least local maximum. Um, what we do have some understanding of, or some some evidence for, is understanding that like if you have a first order transition, then you don't have to have this sort of um, then it doesn't have to be magical very much anywhere. So you need this competition to sort of sustain itself into the infrared in order to have a really large degree of, of magic. Oh, I see. And that's a non-trivial thing. I see. OK, thanks. I guess even oh. a, a product state of like non-stabilizer states would have extensive uh, mana. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so it's really quite different from the entanglement. Yeah, so here, yeah, so indeed, so. Why did you see yourself this before? But yeah, yeah you, you really, you know, you, you really need to see in this plot, for example, that the mana density increases with subsystem size. It's telling you that there is some entanglement component. And then this detailed analysis of the scaling structure, which is really telling us that the magic exists on all scales. That's a non-trivial thing which doesn't have to happen. You know, you can, as Michael said, you can definitely have extensive mana um, just from product states. So we, we really feel that, or we argue that, that there's more to it than that here. I have a question. Uh, Brian, I was thinking, have you tried to take uh, the Tori code uh, state and uh, r rather than tracing out everything but two spins, um, uh, project everything on the plus state and leave two spin open and see how the mana uh, behaves there? Um, oh, well, short answer is no, I have not done that or thought about it. Because this, this is one of the strange correlators that supposedly, I mean, this gives a, a, a criticalizing partition function. Uh, yeah. If you look at it as a PEPS rather than as a mirror, it's very clear. Yeah. And, uh, and so possibly uh, there you should also see a large value of the mana. Yeah, I, I, the only thing I'll, I think, that, yeah, that's an interesting thought. Um, I, I'll just say in the, in the 
in this qubit case, it's a little bit annoying that there's a technical thing where we need odd prime dimension. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's just a technical thing. I mean, there's, you can still have a notion of T gates, of course. So maybe it'd be better to do like the Z equals three toric code, but uh, I actually don't know if it works there, this strange correlator story. But, but, but possible on two, on two qubits, you could really maximize. Uh, yeah, on two qubits, you're right. Yeah, you could just do the Maximize the stub, yes. Yeah. I have a question actually. Yeah. So I, I don't see any difficulty simulating large and gauge theories. Uh, mainly, so uh, I'm just asking you, but so my, my take is that if you have, if you're worried about like non locality um, within these, like uh, these n degrees of freedom, there are, uh, you can simulate SYK, there are algorithms for that. And if you're worried about like continuous degrees of freedom, there are like algorithms for that. I mean, you're, you're not like a, Simulating the like the continuous degrees of freedom, but you just uh, truncate it down to the low energy subspace. So I, I, I don't see what the difficulty is. Can you explain it? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, good. Let me let me let me clarify. So I, I certainly agree. You can simulate these things. I don't think there's any fundamental obstacle. What I was referring to was the way it scales with the the parameter n. Mm -hmm. So like in ADS CFT, if we take this arbitrarily seriously, as I think we ought to actually, since it works so well, it suggests the number of gates per unit time should be proportional to n squared. Mm -hmm. And I claim there's no algorithm which can achieve that, that I know of. Like what, what, what do you think is the best possible you can do um, with the current? Yeah. Well, so let, let's give an example. So like in SYK, right. it, it should be scale like n, but the best current algorithm is n to the seven halves. Now, we, we have this sparse model, which hasn't appeared yet, but where we can reduce it down to essentially n, up to, some, up to the fact that they're fermions, mm -hmm. or very close to n. So, and I think, actually, that may be an interesting direction for the gauge theory case. But the essential problem in the gauge theory case, you have three kinds of terms. Like, let's just think about trace f squared for non abelian gauge theory. There's the quadratic terms, the cubic terms, and the quartic terms. And there's a different number of terms that occur for each of those, like there's n to the four terms in the quartic. But the normalization factor is just g squared, which is only 1 over n in the tuft limit. So if you just like do L1 counting of the number of terms in Hamiltonian, it ends up scaling faster than, than n squared. And all the terms scale differently, but that one in particular scales faster than, than n squared. So it suggests to me that we're not taking full advantage of the structure uh, when simulating that thing. I mean, it's no surprise, of course, that, that this totally general algorithm doesn't know anything about right. gauge theory. But I think there's a there's a question there. Like whether you have a simulation cost in some space, which is more like the L2 norm or some other state dependent norm, et cetera. That's what I meant. All right, thank you all. Yeah, if there are no other questions, then uh, let's uh, thank Brian again.